Seahawks coming off of another tough loss in Seattle against the 49ers. They lose the, this game 36 to 24. They they now lose three games in 10 days. Not an ideal stretch for the Seahawks whatsoever. Tough game to watch for for a lot of it, to be honest. Will, what are your initial thoughts of uh, the 49ers coming into Seattle? Yeah, I uh, can't fall behind like that. I uh, can't spot the 49ers points. Um, you know, I felt like that interception early on from Gino in the red zone, you're driving, you need to come away with points there, especially against a 49ers team like this. And they've had your number really, I think it's what, four or five straight wins in a row against you. Like you're at home. You need to make sure you're able to get the crowd in it, crowd involved. If you go down and you score a touchdown there, you're coming out of the first quarter and you're up at least by three, probably by four. Now, all of a sudden, this is a different ball game, right? You put the pressure on San Francisco, and I just didn't really feel like Seattle did that. And, you know, I get it. San Francisco got healthy at the right moment, right? They get uh, Debo back, Kittle's at full strength. Basically, everyone is completely healthy except for CMC on the offensive side. And so you're going to get the full gamut of tools that they have while you're still dealing with a bunch of injuries on your defense, specifically your defensive line. But – I, I just didn't like the game plan at the start. It felt like the second half adjustments that they made, that's always going to be a promising sign. Like you go from putting up three points in the first half, and then all of a sudden in the second, you put up 21. Like that's great. But I feel like those adjustments can be made a little bit sooner in the first and second quarter. When you watch this team right now and they go hurry up, that's when they're at their best. Now I understand why there's a lot of fear behind going into the hurry up. Uh, because if you hurry up and you go three and out, all of a sudden your defense is back on the field after only a minute or two, right? And if you keep doing that, now your defense is getting worn out and exhausted. Yet, I feel like when Geno Smith goes into the hurry up, that it feels like when he seems to be doing his best. That's when he's able to make quicker reads. He's finding his open receivers. And Seattle really seems to be taking advantage of you know the conditioning aspect that certain other teams might not have that they have because they've been practicing this. Um, the other worry that I have in this right now is, right, McDonald comes out, he's got the hat on, run the ball. It's very clear that he wants to run the football more and more in this game. And you do to an extent, right? You get Kenneth Walker, his 14 carries. Here's the problem. He got 32 yards. <laughs> it felt like early on in the season, at least in his first game and then his first game back from injury, and even Charbonnet had a game where – you were taking advantage of what the other defense was doing and you were able to get a lot of yards on the ground. You can run the football as many times as you want. If you're averaging less than three yards a run, you're in a lot of trouble. Really, you need to be averaging, you know, close to four yards a run, at least three and a half. Because if you do three plays, three runs, three and a half yards, you'll get the first down and you'll keep the chains moving. So when I look at that number, that's probably the number that scares me the most is, yeah, you got walker the ball more but you got dominated on that offensive line and he only got 32 yards i mean his long run was eight he can fall forward and get four charbonnet's long was nine you and i were talking after the giants game about how they need to how they need to run the ball and work the running game we'll, we'll get into the offensive line in a little bit and that's a glaring huge issue we've talked about the line on both sides of the game but the offensive line as we'll get into the stats is just terrible but Rough. the uh, San Francisco team was able to come into Seattle. Their rushing game, 33 carries for 228 yards, an average of seven. Through the air, they, they went to 255 yards. Brock Purdy was three touchdowns, no interceptions. Geno Smith ended with one touchdown, two interceptions. But the defensive line, in the same light, you know, they gave up 220 rushing yards. Brock Purdy had 19, but... Their top two guys had 99 yards on 10 carries, 73 rushing yards on nine carries. Both sides of the ball, the, off the offensive and defensive line is just atrocious, and they're not going to get anywhere if they keep playing with where like they currently are. Right. I mean, it's very clear on the defensive line that they miss Murphy uh, a lot. Um, obviously, Mafe played a little bit in that game. He was able to get a little bit done. Jones was able to play a little bit in that one. Um, as I'm going through, I don't – Derek Hall played a little bit. He has a tackle. When they were at their healthiest and you had your four starters, Mafe Hall, um, Williams, and then Murphy, right, it felt like that's when you're at your your greatest. That's when that defensive line was getting after quarterbacks and getting a bunch of sacks, and you were, had all these pressures. That was able to alleviate some of that pressure that the secondary was feeling. Well, now you have all those injuries on the D-line. Then 
you lose your top cover corner and reek wool and he's out and it sounds like he's going to be out for a little bit i mean it just didn't look good from top to bottom when you can't stop that run game d line wise well now you got to start committing more guys into the box now you're leaving more guys on an island that's where you see those big plays happen i mean shoot even julian love who was a game time decision like obviously warrior he comes out he plays he's got 10 tackles seven solos but the thing that's going to stand out in everyone's eyes is the missed tackle on debo now to be fair that's kind of a crazy play it's a horrifically thrown under ball you know he purdy i don't know if he doesn't have the arm strength to make that throw i don't know if i like off the top of my head i can't remember if he got hit i don't remember if the ball got hit like it was just a bad throw. Debo has to come back to it, but Love isn't able to adjust his angle. He whiffs, Debo takes it to the house, and all of a sudden now it's a big play touchdown that they got. So some of it is, yeah, I'm going to give you some leeway because you've had all these injuries, right? And you're fighting through uh, different nicks and scratches and scrapes and sprained ankles and you know whatever you have. But at the same time, you just went from the number one team in the NFC West and it frankly wasn't close to now you're dangerously close to being the third best team in the NFC West and it's been 11 days like that can't happen right even with all these injuries your quarterback didn't get hurt if Geno Smith was the one that went out then it might be more lenient on it but right now you got to figure out something. I think that's why they made the trade with the Jaguars. They wanted to bolster that defensive line depth. I mean, Nuosu, hopefully, fingers crossed, he'll eventually get back soon. Murphy, hopefully, he'll eventually get back soon because right now you need those two back, and then that'll alleviate some of the pressure on uh, guys like Williams. Williams has to feel like he's doing it all by himself when it comes to stopping the run. Jaron Reed is fine, but Jaron Reed is not what Jaron Reed was two or three years ago, and I don't think that Jaron Reed will ever have been comparable to what Murphy and Williams have been doing, right? Like, you want him as your third defensive tackle. That's really strong. When he's your second defensive tackle, then it's, oh, okay, you know, like, we're not going to be amazing against the run. And then you just keep getting injuries and injuries and injuries. Injuries happen in the NFL. You got to find a way to combat them and have other guys step up or hide those issues uh, through defensive scheme. You're going to go through a big stretch run right now where you play a lot of really difficult football games um, and they need to figure out something and they need to figure out something fast. And speaking of the the move that the Seahawks made on Monday, they acquired Jaguars defensive line, uh, lineman defensive tackle, Roy Robertson Harris for mm-hmm. a 2026 sixth round draft pick. He is 31 years old. This year has seven tackles, four quarterback hits, two sacks and one tackle for loss in six games. This article states that Seattle's defense started hot, but has since fallen off as the team has dropped three straight games while allowing over 35 points per contest, the second highest average in the league over the last three weeks. And regarding Robinson Harris's contract, he's in the second year of a three year, $21.6 million contract extension that he signed in 2023. Do you know anything about, you know, Roy Robinson Harris and what he might bring to this team? He's a good depth piece. He's kind of like Jaron Reed, right? Like you now are adding more depth to that position. I think they made that trade because they know that Murphy's going to be out for a little bit, but they also know that some of the twos and threes that they're playing right now, they're not doing what they need to get done, right? They're losing a lot of battles and that's leaving other guys on islands and they're not making plays and that's leading to big runs. You know, they're getting reached. They're getting down blocked. They're getting moved out of their gap. And, and that just frankly can't happen. Like, yeah, you're going to take a step back as a, you know, when you go from your one to your two and you're going to take any, another step back when you go to your three. But at the same time, you need to be able to fight and hold your gap or else they are going to move on from you. It's the NFL. It's a business and it can be very cutthroat. I think the reason that they made this trade was because they know they need more depth and they need more veteran depth. They can't have and risk the the rookie mistake or the second or third year player mistake might have a lot more upside because of the youth, but there's also some downside of that youth. And sometimes it's uh, the lack of football IQ. So I actually don't hate that move. Go bolster up some of that D line depth because you are just so injured there. Uh, But the offense has to do their part too. Like it's the double edged sword. You look your best when you are going up tempo. The problem with going up tempo is whether you score or you give the ball back to the other team, you do it quickly. So they need to find a way to where they can mess with the tempo of 
hey, we just had a big play, let's go fast. Or we just got a first down, let's go fast. And then, oh, we only got three yards on that run. We're going to slow everything down, but still get first downs or still complete balls that put you ahead of the stick, still keep you on time. So you're not facing third and longs. So you're not facing second and longs. So you can go up to the line of scrimmage and go, it's third and two. Are we going to run or are we going to pass? So there are some clear issues that the defense is going through and there is some leniency because of the injuries. At the same time, there are things that this offense needs to start doing to help protect those guys as well. Speaking of the offense, we got to talk about this, this amazing tweet, this amazing, amazing TikTok yeah. that was put together by elite takes at elite takes underscore on Twitter and on TikTok. I'll play the entire video, but this talks about the new conspiracy. The Seahawks have double agents on their offensive line. Here's the video. The worst player in the NFL that is getting significant snaps for their team right now is Seattle Seahawks right tackle Stone Forsythe. And the guy right next to him, right guard Anthony Bradford, is also one of the very worst starters in the NFL. I feel like I'm watching two secret agents teaming up together to completely wreck an offense. Let's put this into perspective. Stone Forsythe has allowed the most pressures in the NFL with 35. The guy in second place, Terrence Steele of the Cowboys, has allowed 19 pressures. Almost half what Stone Forsythe has allowed. Like, look at all of these guys. There's a clear grouping and then there's him i promise you the more you watch these guys play football the higher you will get on geno smith it's a miracle that he's only taking like three sacks a game right now i find myself perplexed with their protection plans sometimes like connor williams is going to try to work something out these guys act like they've got it and then here comes kyle duggar screaming off the edge unblocked if geno isn't an absolute superhero their drive will be over the moment they get behind the stick and if you're wondering why the seahawks are stuck behind the sticks all the time this is a pretty great representation of why if they didn't have kenneth walker who can occasionally go superhuman and make a bunch of guys miss this would be the worst rushing attack in the nfl it is so painful to watch i'd rather slam my head into a wall the tight ends cannot block either lakin tomlinson is also really bad like if i was ryan grubb you might as well not even bother the seahawks are such a great example of why line play is everything to offensive success because they have a great quarterback they have great receivers they have a good running back duel and yet for the second straight year they are getting wrecked and they cannot do what they want to do on offense because the line is so incompetent and any defense with a pulse is going to wreck them. Forsyth is a third stringer. It's very unfortunate that Abe Lucas and George Fant both went down, but as for the rest of them, it's just inexcusable. You cannot build a makeshift offensive line in this league and expect your offense to be just fine. You just can't. So recapping that, what he just talked about is Stone Forsyth and Charles Cross. If you look at PFF and you go to the amount of pressures allowed so far this year, Stone Forsyth has allowed 35 so far this year, which is first. Second place is 19, a guy from Dallas, uh, Terrence Steele. And then tied for second is Charles Cross. So both of Seattle Seahawks tackles are one and two in the amount of pressure allowed so far this year. That's not ideal. That's not really how the offensive line is supposed to operate. I don't think they're supposed to allow the, ru the rush to come in right is that correct am i falling no no they're not they're supposed to keep them away keep them <laughs> far far away I'll, I'll protect the o-line a little bit okay uh stone forsyth remember he is your third string tackle for a reason right you have abraham, abraham lucas who's supposed to be your starting right tackle he's been out he's been dealing with a bunch of injuries when lucas has been healthy you have one of the better tackle duos, young tackle duos in the NFL. The problem is the last two years, the guy can never stay healthy. Then you bring in George Fant, who, look, Seahawks fans have known him from his first stint. He has some things that he does well. He has some things that he doesn't do well. But he does pass pro fairly decently because he is a former basketball player. So he's got those quick feet that he's able to move around, and bounce back and forth. He goes out week one. So now you're down to Stone Forsythe. And... Right now, he's proving why he's a third-string guy. Now, also, to be fair to Stone Forsythe, in the last three weeks, he's gone against two of the better defensive ends in the NFL right now. He went against Aiden Hutchinson, who had seven and a half sacks through six games. And really, that's five and a half games because he broke his leg in one of the more gruesome football injuries I've ever seen. I was going to say R.I.P. Hutchinson's leg. Like that. that was awful. Dude, when... When your ankle and uh, your foot make a C, that's never a good sign. And the worst part is, is he's in the middle of making an incredible sack on Dak Prescott. Like, if he wasn't as good as he is, he doesn't break his leg because he wouldn't be in the position to break his leg. It's incredible. So you go up against that guy, and then 
two weeks later, you get to go against Nick Bosa after Nick Bosa has finally gotten healthy. And Nick Bosa has one of the more impressive games I've ever seen. He had something like 14 pressures or something like that in that game. Absolutely insane. Is some of that on Stone Forsyth? Yeah, but those are also two guys that were working some of the best offensive tackles in the NFL. They work all pro guys. There's a reason why when teams get ready to play the 49ers defense and get ready to play the Lions defense, they go, where is Hutchinson? Where is Bosa? And we have to know every single time that we go out. Obviously, I've been harping on it. I think everyone's been harping on it. The middle three, your right guard, your center, and your left ta- uh, left guard, excuse me, have really struggled this season. And it's not just in the pass game. It's in the run game as well. That's why you see Kenneth Walker having 14 carries for only 32 yards. They need to do a much, much, much better job of getting onto blocks and then staying on them. They're not moving their feet and getting themselves in the correct position to take on a defensive lineman. Now, it's easy for me to say sitting here from my closet, it's much harder for me you know, to get out there and do it. I can't do it. Otherwise, you'd be talking about me playing for the Seahawks, and uh, you'd have someone else much prettier than me, I'd assume, in this position. <laughs> so it's easier said than done, but they need to figure out if it's a technique issue, if it's a strength issue, if it's a football IQ issue, and it's probably some combination of the three. Football IQ issue, that's an easy thing to fix. You just need more time in the meeting room. If it's a strength issue, that then, one, becomes on them. They have to build up their strengths. You know, if they have a weakness in a certain area, you got to build that up. You can't leave it there. But at this point in the season, your weaknesses are your weaknesses. So your coaching staff needs to design blocking schemes that fit the personnel that you have, right? Like, if I had Kevin Durant on my basketball team, and I'm playing up against, you know, the 76ers, I'm not going to tell Kevin Durant that he has to go into the low post and try and dunk on Joel and beat every single play. I'm going to tell, hey, Kevin, you're going to get the ball at the top of the key, make Joel come out of the paint to guard you, and then you'll use your speed to run around him. So there might be uh, some changes that they need to make in the offensive playbook as well. You know, hey, if we don't have the guys that can reach a three tech in an outside zone, guess what? We don't get a call outside zone. We're going to call mid zone so that maybe we can cut back underneath it. So there are just little things that I think as the season goes, the coaching staff can also look at their players that they have and say, well, this is what we have. We have to find a way to win with this crew and make those adjustments. And hopefully those adjustments start coming because you can't just sit Gino back in the pocket and say, we're going to throw 52 times in a game. That's just not going to be successful for this team. And watching that that video that he made, it really makes you appreciate what Gino has been able to do with that offensive line. It looks like an intramural flag football league to where the quarterback gets the ball. They immediately have to start running to try to huck it down the field. You know, he's currently leading the NFL in passing mm-hmm. yards, 1,778 uh, yards per game, 296.3. He's also currently eighth in completion percentage. So while he's he has some of the most pressure in all of the football on him at all times, you know he's able to do what he's able to do. And Kenneth Walker did look good those first few games. They weren't able to get the yardage this last game. It's wild kind of seeing the the state of that offensive line where they currently right. are at, and the fact that they were able to get those three wins off the, off the board right away was, was pretty big for you know where they currently are at. 100%. Well, and right now you're about to go through Atlanta, Buffalo, LA, you get a bye week, and then you get San Francisco and Arizona, you know, so that's your next six games, right? So when they talk about the NFL season, usually you break it up into quarters. So it used to be nice and easy. You went your first four games, second four, third four, fourth four. Well, now you kind of have to add in an extra game into one of those. But right now you're approximately through, you know, a quarter and a half, right? That's what you're through. And you're at 500. And if I told you going into the year, hey, the Seahawks are going to go through their six games and they're going to be three and three, Connor, you'd be like, yeah, that's about what I expect. When you look, okay, they're going to play Denver. Denver's not that good. That should be a W. New England, they're not that good. That should be a W. Miami's pretty good. And it's early. That's probably an L. Detroit, probably an L. New York, you probably get that one. W. San Fran, uh, probably an L. So if you look at that, right, at the beginning of the season, if I told you you're three and three, you're probably happy about where you're at. But because of the injuries in Miami, you start looking at this and you're like, well, maybe we should be four and two. You're going toe to toe with Detroit where it's back and forth, back and forth. Well, you know, we just missed that one. 
So I think there's some promising things even in the losses. Um, and Gino has looked good. I still don't think that – I think that there are very few quarterbacks in the NFL that can sit back there 50 times and you can win with. I'm not saying that Geno is a bad quarterback. I'm not here to get attacked by the Geno Smith hive. I don't think that this offense is working at its best with its personnel if you're sitting back there throwing 52 times. I do think you need to throw the football. I think your best three weapons, well, your best two weapons, uh, aside from Kenneth Walker, are on the outside. You need to find ways to get JSN the ball, and you need to find ways to get DK Metcalf the ball every single week. I mean, shoot, even in the 49ers game, like, Obviously, his stats are down compared to what they'd been the couple of weeks before that. But you have to remember, he has the big touchdown taken completely away because of the penalty, because you had two guys in motion at the same time. So, and then Tyler Lockett's obviously Tyler Lockett. He's always going to find ways to come up big when you need him most. But all of that to say, you're about where you should be. You just have had three straight losses, so it feels worse. You're going into the meaty part of your schedule. You need to probably go two and three, two and four in your next six. Three and three would be great. If you went into the bye in your next three games and you went one and two or two and one, you're probably pretty ecstatic. Atlanta looks really good. Buffalo looks really, really freaking good. They, they might just got Amari Cooper also. Right. Of course they did. And then you're coming back to play. And I guarantee the way that it's been going for the Seahawks, Puka Nakua and Cooper Cup will both magically be 100% healthy by the time you play LA. So you need to go through this next six game stretch or six week stretch, I should say, with five games. You need to be about two and three or three and two, somewhere in there. And I feel good about where you're at and your chances. But to do that, you have to fix that interior offensive line play. Stone Forsyth has it got to figure out a way to stop defensive ends you can't keep leaving him one-on-one in an island now life will get easier Atlanta doesn't have that premier defensive end pass rusher Buffalo doesn't really have that premier defensive end pass rusher and LA doesn't really have that premier defensive end pass rusher so hopefully those numbers should get fixed a little bit with him and then as always you got to find ways to get K9 going because if teams have to respect your run and your pass it makes your passing game a whole lot easier. And it's not Geno Smith, one, two, three, hope that someone pops open or else I got to thread a needle. And the guy's name is Stone, Stone for heaven's sake. You know, you'd think that would help or something. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, you know, the Seahawks, they're, they're big weapons on the offensive side of the ball. Those three receivers are, are, are solid. JSN has mm-hmm. been getting some more targets, some more grabs. He's looked solid. Um, and kind of moving into, into the Seahawks Falcons preview, the Falcons, their last three games are, are three and oh, you know, the Hawks are mm-hmm. on three. They uh, face the Saints. They beat them narrow, narrowly in Atlanta. They then beat the Buccaneers 36 to 30. And then they beat the Panthers at at Carolina. Um, so this game will be 10 o'clock on Sunday in, in Atlanta. Right now, the Falcons are four and two. They're leading their division. You got Kirk Cousins. You got B. John Robinson. You got some weapons over there that you're going to have to try to stop. You know, we'll see if they can stop B. John Robinson. He's got, you know, some insane ability. What are you, what are your initial thoughts heading into this game with, with the Falcons? Got to find a way to stop B. John and stop Tyler Algier. Uh, those are the two running backs that Atlanta has. Uh, Algier is more of your pound running back. Uh, Bijan's going to be more of your shifty, elusive running back. Not that he can't run people over either. This defense has to find a way to stop the run because then you're forcing Atlanta to throw the ball and throw the ball every single down, right? Like what you're seeing right now out of your team, you need to be able to do that to other teams. Uh, Not that Kirk Cousins isn't a good quarterback. I'm actually a big Kirk Cousins fan. And just because you stop the run against this team does not mean that Kirk Cousins can't still win this game for Atlanta. But I'll tell you what, it makes it one hell of a lot harder, right? It's way, way harder when a defense can just key in on one thing, what you're going to do and attack it. The other thing that this team needs to do offensively, they have to start fast. Your last two games, really your last three games, you've let the other team score once, sometimes twice before you even get going. That can't happen. If you're always playing from behind the eight ball, you have to get out of what your game plan was, which McDonald has made it very clear. He wants to be a 
a team that runs the ball as well as throws the ball. Well, guess what? You can't run the football when you're down 14 to zero. You can't run the football when you're down 10 to zero, right? So this offense needs to start fast. It's something that they struggled with all year long. If they can start fast, they should be able to keep up with Atlanta. And all of a sudden, instead of having to find a way to have two scores with five minutes left, maybe you're just looking at one score or maybe you're just looking at, hey, we need to find a way to ice this game at the very end. They can get off to a fast start uh, like what Seattle can do and continue to feed DK Metcalf. There are a lot of Seahawks fans right now that are continuing to hate on DK for his fumbles and other issues that he's had the past couple of weeks. Here's what I'd remind everyone. For every time that he fumbles and he makes a mistake like that, I feel like he has two or three plays that more than make up for it in other areas. There are the greatness of DK is how strong he is compared to every other wide receiver and other every other DB that he has to go against. The downside is he knows he's that much stronger. So at times he can be careless while he's trying to get the extra yard. I'm not going to crucify him for that. I think that there are a lot of Seahawks fans that try to find blame. And right now it feels like he's the one that's getting blamed because they want to protect uh, other players, right? Or other coaches at times. And I don't feel like that that is fair to DK. Right now, DK has kept you in games. In fact, I think in one game, he won you a game as opposed to, well, he's lost us the Detroit and the 49ers game. DK didn't lose you those games. He had mistakes, but in other games, his reckless abandon has gotten them into big plays, big explosive plays, big explosive touchdowns. And sometimes those touchdowns were the difference between them winning and them losing. So I would look at uh, DK to continue to have a big game, feed him, feed him often. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was doing the, the Coop podcast earlier and we were talking about John Mateer. It's like kind of comparing to DK Metcalf, Metcalf yep. and, and that they both have the insane <clears throat> ceiling and they both have the ultimate belief in themselves to make every play on the field, which they can make. It's just a matter mm -hmm. of, you know, you if you want that ceiling, you also get some of the downside, which is the fumbles, the interceptions, you know, some of these these plays where you're shaking your head it, in order to get, you know, what you want out of them. They have to kind of do this. And sometimes you'd wish that John Mateer would throw the ball away, just, you know, you know, yeah. QB slide or DK Metcalf, just get down. But that's kind of you got to take both sides of it if you want, you know, it's, their true ability. The way that I've seen it, like truly for me, it's playing the result. So the person that I look at right now is obviously with 1080, I do a lot of Oregon Ducks coverage. I've worked a lot of big Dan Lanning games. I got hired the same time that he did. So every single game that he's ever done, I've done the post game show for, right? And everyone is loving him this week for having the onside kick against Ohio State, throwing the 12th man out on the field so that they made sure they didn't give up the big play, but they could also run a bunch of time off the clock. You know, not being afraid to go for it on fourth down. Well, guess what? Those are the same people, the people that are calling him Big Balls Dan Lanning right now. They're showing them Randy Marsh meme where he's, you know, got his junk in the wheelbarrow. They're the same people that crucified him last year when he took on UW and he went for it on fourth down three times and he didn't get any of the fourth downs. If he gets just one of those, that UW game probably goes a different way and they probably win that football game. But people crucified him on that one because the results ended up in them not getting it them losing and so everyone blames him well now he steals a couple possessions in this game against ohio state they win and everyone loves him you love dk when he runs through three tackles and gets an extra five yards for the first down you crucify dk when he runs through three tackles but the fourth guy gets the perfect peanut punch as he's fallen down you can't just sit there and play the results i want aggression I want aggressive players. I don't want players that are just diving onto the ground anytime they see someone, unless you're Tyler Lockett, because I love Tyler Lockett and I'd like him. He's got a part. service time. He can do that. He's he's also well aware of what his body is and what right. he can and can't take. He can't take a full season of the NFL where he's getting tackled a hundred times. He has to get down. That's what he does. When it comes to DK, what DK does is he runs through arm tackles and he runs over people. I'm not going to pull back on the reins there because of all the great plays that he, he can make. Sometimes you have to take the good with the bad. The other thing that I would bring up right now when Seattle, and I forgot to mention this in the San Francisco game, 
they have to stop making stupid mistakes. And when I say that, it's two guys in motion at the same time. It's jumping off sides uh, when you snap the ball, you know, before you snap the ball on offense. It's being in the wrong position, using the wrong footwork. So now you have to hold, right? It's things like that, the little things that always seems to rear up on the Seahawks team in a big moment. It's a third and five and you need it. You're in the red zone and now you take a holding penalty. So you're out of field goal position, right? Or you're at least out of a possibility of getting a touchdown. Those little mistakes have to stop happening. If they continue to happen, you're going to see this Seahawks team continue to lose. And then also speaking to the Falcons depth chart, you know, it's not just Kirk Cousins, B. John Robinson. There's also their entire receiving core, Drake London, Darnell Mooney, Ray Ray McLeod, the third Cal Pitts at tight end. You know, yeah. this is probably going to be a pretty high scoring game. The over under right now is at 49 and a half. Atlanta this is only favored. Atlanta is only Atlanta is only favored by two and a half right now. What are your, what are your thoughts on those lines? Um, yeah, that sounds about right. So basically what they're saying is Atlanta and Seattle, they're even teams because it opened at three. Uh, Atlanta is the home team. So usually when you're at home and you have a decent home field advantage, Atlanta does, you get two or three points or so. Um, and the betting lines have bet it now. So it's Atlanta, uh, minus two and a half, right? Some books you're going to see minus three, maybe one or two, you'll see minus three and a half. Uh, but basically what that's saying is Atlanta is going to be favored because they are the home team. Uh, Seattle did travel a little, a little bit of a ways. And if it was a neutral site game, Atlanta might be favored by a point because of what they've done this year, which to be honest with you, I would agree with, especially the last couple games. What you've seen out of Kirk Cousins is that he's getting more and more comfortable coming off his Achilles injury and he's moving around more. Now, I'm not claiming that Kirk Cousins is Lamar Jackson. He never was before he hurt that Achilles. But what Kirk Cousins is able to do is move around in the pocket so that he's avoiding that rush. They might still get pressure on him. They still might hit him, but he's getting the ball out. It's a much different Kirk Cousins than what you saw week one when he took on Pittsburgh, where he literally couldn't move. He was stuck in the pocket, and he was getting hit on every play by T.J. Watt because T.J. Watt had that thing timed up that well Kirk Cousins is able to move a little bit more if Seattle can find a way to get pressure on him I like their chances that D-line has to play a lot better and then offensively you need to find a way to start fast get in the end zone and stop committing stupid penalties and stupid mistakes over under 0.5 plays from Michael Penix Jr. in this game zero point uh I'm gonna go under I, I don't to my knowledge you haven't seen him this year yeah. I don't believe how about you line him up as a wide receiver, throw it over no. to him. He throws a deep ball across the field. Nah, you're not putting that <laughs> risk on him. Come on now. You're not putting that risk on Penix. I am a little surprised that you haven't seen him at all. Um, but then again, Atlanta, every game that they've played has been close. Like I feel like Atlanta doesn't blow anyone out and they don't get blown out. Like Steelers game, that was back and forth. You lose that one by you lost that one by eight. Your worst loss, think about this. Your worst loss this year in Atlanta is you lost by eight to the Steelers week one. Also, the Steelers only kicked field goals in that game. No <laughs> touchdowns. So just remember that. But you beat Philly by one. You lose to Kansas City by five. New Orleans, you win by two. You go to OT with Tampa. And then you kind of sort of blew out Carolina, but they're Carolina. They're horrible. You beat them by 18, right? So – Every other game that they've gone in has been close. I think this one's close too. It's just, will Seattle be able to make the big plays at the end of the game? Or will Atlanta be able to make the big plays? Whoever makes the most uh, explosive plays in this one, I think will get the W. So 10 o'clock Sunday, it's going to be on Fox. It'll be game time weather of 71 degrees in Atlanta. Make sure to like and subscribe to the Couch GM for more updates on the Seahawks. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below, and we'll see you on the next episode.